Okay. Bubba throws some punches. Mr. Clemens. Right? Yes. Is this on the test on Monday? Like, is this unit two still? Yes. No. It is. It's really the last big thing. Is this test on Monday? Unit four. It's really the last big thing. So, we're going to go over this. The only thing really left for us to do tomorrow is we're going to look at witchcraft. We're going to talk about a couple of um, late 16th century thinkers, and then we're going to look at some Baroque art. Um, Baroque is a long art period, but we're going to look at the really the Catholic Reformation version of it. So, art that appeared between 1550 and about 1600. So that'll include Rubens, Caravaggio, uh, Velasquez, and a handful of people like that. Um, okay, so I've got a variety of different sources for the Age of Exploration. Um, they completely rewrote this chapter in McKay to include about five pages or six pages of background. Okay, I'm going to kind of skip over it, but I at least want you to, to know what's in it. And what they were trying to establish is that like Columbus didn't happen in a vacuum. I mean, that's really the only thing that you have to remember is that like the idea that like Columbus is the catalyst for everything that has ever been commercial, you know, outside of the orbit of the Western Mediterranean. They just wanted to say that, okay? That there was a very vibrant trade that existed among a lot of different cultures. Some of them were African, Indian, Chinese, Middle Eastern, it included the Safavids, it included the Ottoman Empire, and that Europe, even prior to Columbus, the, the big kind of, you know, knock down the fences thing for European uh, commerce was the Venetians and Genoese. And so it gives you that background as well. It shows you what was traded, where it was traded, and when those, those kingdoms started. Anybody, I mean, the coolest thing I think that I've seen in, in terms of the Geico commercials is Marco Polo playing Marco Polo. That the that was in that above ground yeah. pool. Isn't that like the coolest yeah, thing? Yeah. So he like, he fights, see, see, Mark, you know, and at the end he's like, he gets it. So then he's playing himself. So great Geico commercial, one of the best. Um, but that's kind of like, that's, if there was a point of origin for the Europeans in terms of getting involved in this overseas trade, it kind of started there, right? There was these massive overland trades that, or, or trade networks that were coming in uh, where the Mongols had kind of gotten introduced to all these great distant lands. Chinese were way the heck ahead on everything. Okay, had cities that had a million or more in terms of their population, 600,000. There's nothing even recognizably close to that in Europe. So when the Mongols went there and started to bring some of that stuff back, word kind of got out to like just the extravagance of some of these distant places. And Marco Polo was one of the people that kind of heard about it and then went there and witnessed it and then started this thing called Marco Polo's Travels. And so, I mean, it's way ahead of the game. Like we're talking about 13th century um, and the Europeans don't really get around to the idea of becoming um, an embedded force in this type of overland trade until really the, the 15th century. So Marco Polo's travels kind of like piques everybody's interest and that's sort of where it starts. Okay, so there's some stuff in there about that. Um, there is this guy by the name of Zhang He which is, I guess, H-E, but it's spelled, it's pronounced H-U-H. So I took a crack at it. But like when they said, um, like Columbus, I guess, like as the, the great port, you know, the great explorer uh, traveled like 2,000 miles. This guy did about 12,005, all right? And the, just the sheer level of, ex, uh, of exploration that this, this uh, Chinese admiral had uh, done with his fleet in the early 1400s was like six times the amount that anybody was going to do in the 1500s or early 1600s. So what they were trying to say is that there were people that were really, really, um, I don't know, decisive early on. Uh, they mentioned, you know, the Vikings, they, that, that sort of thing. They also mentioned Mansu Musa, which was a, what's called the Malian Empire in West Africa. And that apparently they had tried to do Columbus before Columbus did Columbus, and they weren't able to find that westward, you know, path. 
to the Indian spice trade, but they do have like documentation that there were fleets like of up to like 1500 ships that tried to make that tack. And either the, chip, the ships themselves technologically were not able to make it or whatever the case was, but there were attempts. You know, so that's really what it's about. The first four or five pages is just kind of taking you through there and showing you where the trading empires were, um, whether it was you know, the, the big components of the Indian spice trade, uh, the Eastern African spice trade, which was, um, or really just the Eastern Indian Ocean trade itself and all of these kingdoms along the eastern coast of Africa. So if you hear like Mombasa and Mogadishu and some of these places, I mean, they were like off the chain prosperous around like 11, 1200, right? And then so the Mediterranean, remember, was the Venetians and Genoese finally kind of became players in that, in that world, all right? Genoese was more on the kind of Western Mediterranean and eventually got involved in some of the North African. The Venetians were, I mean, as far east and eventually got involved in, in Constantinople. And then the Genoese also got involved in the Black Sea. Remember that whole thing with um, the, the Black Plague and where supposedly they were like firing bodies over the top? Okay, I think that was that port was called Kaffa. But the Genoese were playing to try to maintain or, or gain some kind of monopoly over it. And that's sort of where the plague kind of got introduced into Europe. So, so there's a lot of stuff there that kind of talks about the sort of things that were being traded. And there's a really good kind of just it shows you where the routes were uh, and, and kind of what was established on each of those routes. But the center of the universe prior to the Columbus and the Gama and all these other folks that created an Atlantic slave, slave, or, uh, commercial thing uh, was the Indian Ocean. And then it was the Mediterranean, and then it kind of works its way. But the Indian Ocean was sort of the center of the commercial universe, um, at least in the early Middle Ages, before Europe really kind of woke to, to what was going on. So that's really it, and then it gets us to um, really our story. I don't think any of that you would ever be tested on. It's just something that was there to kind of provide some context to say commerce didn't begin and end with the Europeans. It had been going on for a very long time. Um, and even shipping and even exploration and some of those things had been going on for a very long time too. All right. Um, let's see, let's go into unit two then. And this is like a, it's, it's an old copy of the notes, but if you go into miscellaneous, and go into exploration. There's a variety of documents. And this one I love, I just found it today. It's called AP Euro for Idiots. And I think it's just, because it's a very kind of, you know, small, uh, but very organized set of notes for this section. I'm not gonna use it, but it's there for you if you want it. This one, it says Age of Exploration Notes, okay? So what's going on here is, um, and then we're gonna kind of go through each of these pieces. But the first question they're gonna ask you um, is kind of like, why, All right? It's like the Renaissance. You guys remember that essay where it said, you know, what is the Renaissance, but then why was it Italy or why was it Northern Italy in particular? What advantages did they have? And so when you look at this period and where does it start? It starts exactly around the same time as the Italian Renaissance. And that really sucks for your minds because we just got done talking about the Thirty Years' War and that ends in 1648. Now we're backtracking to like the 1450s, okay? Uh, so right around the same time that we saw Ferdinand and Isabella and we saw Henry VII Tudor and the new monarchs and we also saw the Medici and the Italian Renaissance, that's when this is going on. And it's predominantly, or predominantly Portuguese and, or Portugal and Spain that are doing this, okay? It, it really is them for the first 100 years of it. It's, um, you know, the, the routes, the explorers, uh, the colonies, everything is really kind of initiated by Portugal and Spain, okay? So we will get to that, right? Um, there's another question that they'll often ask. I've seen, there's, there's no way that you can get through an AP board exam without seeing something about this period, okay? In the form of an essay, a DBQ, a short answer or something, there's gonna be something, all right? Sometimes it's impact related. A lot of the times it's like causes and motives, 
right? And one of my favorite essays, I think, is one where they have what's called old imperialism, which is this. This is the period from 1450 to 1600. It starts with the Portuguese and Spanish and eventually, to some lesser extent, the Dutch. Uh, through the new imperialism, and new imperialism is the 1880 to 1914 variety where Africa and a variety of other places are conquered, okay? And so there's like a, there's similarities and differences and it makes for a really nice essay, all right? So let's talk a little bit about the causes, okay? Does anybody have any ideas, you know, why did they do this? There's a phrase that seems to be in every European history essay on this topic ever. Okay. Sorry. First one's always going to be God. Okay. That's one of my, that's one of the quotes that you'll remember because that really almost personifies exactly what the causes or what the motives are. Causes are more blanketed. It's like uh, a handful of things. One, there is a reformation that's ultimately going to happen in the 1500s. Spain doesn't really have to deal with it. That's like these are religious circumstances, and they help explain why the Englands and the France and the Netherlands, even though those are Western and maritime states, are not the ones that are going to dominate the age of exploration. Part of it is because there is a religious unity that exists in Spain and Portugal that doesn't exist in these other places, okay? The second is, is that there is a monopoly that existed really up until 1571, where the Ottoman Turks and the Ottoman Navy controls a lot of the trade in the Eastern Mediterranean. So what the, the only world they really knew in order to be able to play that commercial game was in the Eastern Mediterranean, okay? There was no other place. But they're aware of the silks, and they're aware of the spices, and they're aware of the riches that can be gained if somehow they can get a piece of that Indian spice trade. So there is an allure of being a participant or an active player in that game. It's just that they can't get there. All right, The Venetians and the Genoese were really the only ones, and that if there was a European trade monopoly, it belonged to them. So it's like you have two barriers. Venice and, Gen and Genoa kind of play whatever role Europe has as middleman uh, in, you know, North African gold or, you know, the overland Silk Road or whatever the case may be. Um, and then it's the Eastern Mediterranean dominated by the Ottoman Turks. So there really isn't any place for them to go. The only place that they could go is West. And that's why when you look at it, it starts out really piecemeal. All right, there's like, and I'll show it to you on the map, like where the for very first place is almost like, like it would be like uh, discovering uh, Cuba from Key West. You know, that's really like the beginning. It was like one little tip of Africa that was literally on the, the bottom side of the Straits of Gibraltar. And then they found North Africa on that tip, tried to use that as a stronghold. And eventually because of the gold caravan routes, they just kept going. And they discovered that they were A, participants in the gold caravan routes, and eventually they wanted to gain full control of it. All right, and they got Canton, and we'll talk about some of the advantages. So, causes, motives, and advantages is the kind of essay that you should be thinking about. And we'll get to some of the, you know, the other things as well. All right, so, political centralization, we mentioned that. All right, Isabel and Ferdinand, Isabel and Ferdinand, um, Portugal, because what the hell else is Portugal going to do? You know, it's, it's so isolated from the rest of European affairs that if it doesn't become a maritime power of some kind, it, it really doesn't matter. Like, they don't matter. Right? So that seems to be like the one place that they can kind of make their mark. Right? And if you look at geography, let me just open up the map so that you can kind of see it. Oh, that sucks. Has it not been on the whole time? No. no. Yeah. Really? Not <laughs> necessary for that. Yeah, that, that would have been a problem. All right. It'll be on in just a second. Like I said, low grade version. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
So yeah, when I was <laughs> navigating through these notes, you hey, yeah, like, okay. feel free to stop me if, yeah. if something doesn't seem right, okay? All right, so let me go back to this. Um, in the age of exploration, there is, um, in the miscellaneous folder, there is a section called the age of exploration. So let me backtrack. Remember what I said, age of exploration, Euro for idiots, all right? you like stop and rewind about 10 minutes that's kind of what I was talking about um, the other is um, the age of exploration notes and that's kind of what I was working off of a little bit then there's one that's called trade routes AP euro and that's the one that I'm going to open up just to kind of show you um, I know right high tech okay so here's Portugal here's Spain here's Venice and Genoa who have dominated those trade routes Here's the Ottoman Empire that takes control of Constantinople, which really was kind of like the commercial capital of Europe up until 1453 when it was overthrown and renamed Istanbul. The Black Sea was a major trade area. This is where Kaffa is. If everybody can see that on the map. And that's where the Black Plague, where, where some of the major trade routes were as well. Alexandria and Cairo were a big part of the early trade networks. Down here, that's where Mombasa and Mogadishu and all of those areas, that really was, there was about three or four coastal enclaves that were part of this Indian Ocean trade, all right? So for Portugal, it literally starts here. Does everybody know what I'm talking about? The Key West to Cuba thing now? It's called Suta. It literally is right there. Okay, that's going to be the, the first place that's going to be gained by any European powers as like a stronghold in Africa, in North Africa, and it occurred in 1415. From that point forward, there was really just a few ventures down the coast of Africa, and then there was control over some of the island chains off of, off of the coast. Okay, and they, they, their one was called the Azores. There's the, basically every one of our freaking hurricanes came from one of these places. Cape Verde, Canary, Madeira, Azores. One of those, uh, it seems like that's the point of origin for every damn hurricane that destroys us. Right? That's where it was, okay? Um, this, and it kind of, it's a cool map. It shows you sort of like, this is what Europe gives people, soap and horses. And us hurricanes. Okay, and hurricanes. India though was the, and India was the jewel. All right, and then they figured out that these islands uh, supported sugar plantations and then that provided a whole new uh, wrinkle on what they were going to do uh, in the Americas as well. Okay, um, so the, the slave trade really doesn't, st it starts very local. All right, it starts really on the outside of the African coast. Um, and then the plantation economy, once it's established in the 1500s, uh, I'll explain this in just a second, because African slaves was sort of like plan B. Plan A was Amerindian slaves, and they killed them all. All right, and so once they had literally depopulated like islands, and I mean like wiped out the entire population of islands, then somebody was like, oh, that's really terrible. Now who's going to get our gold? or who's going to get our silver. And then um, they said, hey, you know what? Um, there's Africans and they might be more suitable to the climate. That was actually said. And it was said by a missionary by the name of Bartolome de las Casas, who goes down in history as a great humanitarian that convinced, <laughs> no, that convinced Philip II that uh, he, they, they were decimating the American Indian populations. So it's like you read the A, point of that and forget the B point. The A point was Bartolome de las Casas was a great humanitarian who wrote uh, in defense of the natives and all of these things that talked about uh, the extraordinary genocide that was being committed against, um, you know, Caribbean island, uh, you know, tribes and other things. And then they forgot to mention that de las Casas also said uh, Africans might be a, a suitable alternative. Okay, so the K and the alt, both of that, all right? Um, we'll get to that later too, but I'll keep that map open just so that you guys have it. Um, 
This is all kind of typed up, gives you a little bit of background. Sometimes they talk about discovery, reconnaissance, and expansion. Recon, if anybody's familiar with it, is just kind of getting a print, okay? It's just sort of like what's there. And a lot of it was that, it was fact-finding missions. Europe, Europeans didn't know much about the world. I mean, they had some people that had written about it. I told you about Marco Polo's travels. Um, there was gonna be one later uh, by this guy by the name of Oviedo, who writes what's called a, a general history of the Indies. And so they're, they're kind of, they're getting familiar with it. And the map makers are kind of doing the trial and error thing and discovering, oh, hey, this is a big catastrophic set of rocks that wiped out our entire fleet. We have to mark those, you know, and then they built better maps. So it kind of went like that. Um, after reconnaissance and after discovery and all of those things, and after they had put a little footprint, then they kind of moved to the next step, which is to start conquering territory and then starting to monopolize control. And Portugal kind of did that too, uh, where there was great like trade posts. They kind of like sniffed around and said, hey, will you trade with us? We have pickles, you have spices. Okay, I don't know if they had pickles, but I mean, it seemed like that's sort of how it went. Um, and then eventually um, they started to put cannons in their, gun sh in their ships and then they just bombed the hell out of whoever controlled it. And then they kind of walked in and said, hey, all right, cool. And then they said, missionaries, come with us. And then he went around trying to convert everybody to Catholicism. So that was good too. All right. um, we'll get to some of this stuff later, the exploration stuff. Um, this is kind of the thing that we'll talk a little bit about is like motives and objectives. All right? And that's kind of where we get to the gold glory or God glory and, and gold thing. Gold really is what it's about. I mean, it's about getting paid. You know, and they wanted that. They wanted the gold in North Africa. They wanted the spices in India. They wanted control over those trade empires because they were all going to get rich. Glory is another thing, and especially for like a Ferdinand and Isabella, the idea that you can plant your flag for Spain or you can plant your flag for Portugal, and it's gonna bring a lot of joy onto the royal majesties. There's, there's an element of that, and there's the fame that comes along with being the explorer that discovered this or discovered that. God is sort of like the... Yeah, it's like, um, I don't know, let's go to war in Iraq, okay? And then telling everybody that the Iraqis are being, you know, destroyed by this, this evil dictator uh, that uses chemical weapons against them. So you wear this cloak of humanitarianism as you go in and say, well, all we're trying to do is save innocent people from some evil dictator, okay? And then you know that there's some oil trucks that are following, okay? So there is kind of this vibe to it all right the roman catholic church gives a little bit of cover to maybe what some of the motives are so if you say there's all these people and they're you know they're they don't have jesus but they could really use them some jesus um and the roman catholic church and the missionaries can go there and teach them how to pray and get them to heaven and help them end their barbaric practices then that's really the, the big weapon. And even when you're reading like Columbus and some of his exchanges, a lot of it was like that, you know, is that we have the opportunity to spread. In this case, civilization meant different things than it's gonna mean in the late 19th century. Like, you know, democracy and technological advance and all of those things. This was, you know, to bring Christian Christianity to pagan people, okay? Um, and there was a lot of that, okay? Not to mention the fact that you, once you have Christianized them and set up their churches and teaches them and teach them the docility that it allowed the the uh, European peasants to kind of remain in limbo for a thousand years, why not be able to do that in a whole bunch of new places? So they were able to do that as well. Okay, Christianize. Um, part of it was just the next step of the Crusades. You know, if you think about it, Spain and Portugal, they took the Crusades and kind of almost got infected by it. Like, we, we're going to be able to conquer the infidel and we're going to bring Christianity. And then, like, in the 12th and 13th century, it was called Reconquista. And they were going to remove the Muslim influence from the, the Iberian Peninsula. 
And so there was all these religious-oriented wars to be able to expel Muslims and turn former Muslim lands into Christian lands. And they knew that the Muslims not only had a foothold in Spain, but they also had a foothold in North Africa. So it's almost like, you know, you've chased them out of Spain and now we're going to start moving into North Africa. There was even this belief that Ethiopia was this Christian kingdom where this dude named Prester John lived. And that somehow Prester John was like a direct descendant of one of the kings uh, that had visited Jesus after he was born. So they were like, it's going to be a nice two-front war. We've got Christians, and then North Africa is full of Muslims, and then Ethiopia is Christian, and we're going to be able to pinch them from both sides. And so they couldn't wait to be able to extend the Crusades to another region. Okay? Not just India and the Americas and all of that stuff. It really just started at the beginning with Africa. Okay? And beating a Muslim stronghold in Africa in the same way that they tried to do it in Spain and the same way that they tried to do it in the Eastern Mediterranean. Unsuccessfully in the Eastern Mediterranean, successfully the Portuguese and the Spanish in the Iberian Peninsula, and then hopefully uh, successfully again. Doesn't that sound wonderful? Oh, yeah, great. Okay. Doesn't it sound, you know, I guess, oh, we're, we're going to bring light, you know, to those in the dark and we're going to be able to expel, uh, you know, the evil Muslims and replace them with the angelic Christians. It's the same crap that they did in the Eastern Mediterranean. But what they failed to tell you was the Eastern Mediterranean was rich as hell. Okay. And that it was a really good excuse to be able to use the, uh, the, the cloak of crusade in order to be able to get access to that wealth. Okay? The other thing that they don't tell you in North Africa is that's where all the gold caravan routes were, had been. I mean, chests and chests of gold that were dominated by Muslim traders okay, along those routes. Modern day Ghana, all the way through the Sahara. Okay? So if they were able to get an entry point there, they can say whatever they want. Prester John, God, missionaries and everything else. They wanted that gold. All right, they, want, they wanted to get paid. Okay, so the Sudan, Akan, which is present day Ghana, um, the Mediterranean ports uh, that, that dumped from the Sahara, there was a ton of gold. And I would imagine that some of these adventurers might want some a taste of that. And they knew about the spice trade because the Venetians and the Genoese have been bringing pepper, you know, since like the, the 12th century. And there was, a, there was a taste for pepper that the Europeans had. Why? Because their food sucked. Okay? So a little cinnamon, a little cloves, little peppers, some good spices. You can, like, take their crappy, bland food and make it taste like something. All right? So there was a culinary motive for expansion. Okay? That's a lot of different things there. All right? Here's a, a person that, of importance. His name is Prince Henry the Navigator. Okay? Here's the, the catch. He's not a navigator. Okay? He is a prince. He is a political figure in Europe. I'm sorry, in Portugal. And he is the organizer of these African ex ex expeditions, I can say it. Okay? He sets up a navigational school. This is important. It's called Sagres. S-A-G-R-E-S. That's, it's an observatory, it's a place for cartography, it's a place for map making, it's a place for people to get, um, you know, I don't know, like a master's in navigation, at least for that time, all right? And he's the one that is gonna put up the commissions and the finance to start these, the beginning of these raids, all right? This is early 15th century into the middle of the 15th century. He can smell the gold. All right, so he's going to provide these explorers and others the tools in which they can utilize um, getting that gold, and then they do. Okay, it says Henry established trading posts and forts in Guinea. Okay, and then by the time the you know it passes on to King John or Juan the Second in Portugal, um, there there is boats that are starting to come back to Lisbon Harbor with gold. All right. Then, like I said, it's not enough for them to just be like players in the trade game, but to ultimately gain control over the trade monopoly of the gold caravan routes. And that's ultimately what they'll do. And then they start 
creating more entry posts off of the western tip of Africa, and they work their way down. The entirety of the 1400s, that's what Portugal's doing. And they said, now that we got the gold, let's go get us the spices. So then they started to do that. And that's, those are the people that you should know, all right? Has anybody heard of Bartolomeu Diaz? Okay, Diaz, okay, so you started at Suta, which I showed you on the map. This is 1415. By 1434, they're down here. By 1444, they're down here. By 1460, they're down here. By 1480, they're down here. And then Diaz is the first to be able to navigate a ship down to the Horn. Okay, okay? this is called the Cape of Good Hope, 1487. Diaz gets there. Oh, by the way, I gave you this. This is in your notes or in that section. If you go to Age of Exploration, um, it says Age of Exploration handout, and it shows you all of the important people and what they did, what they discovered and when they discovered it. So it looks like this, okay? It shows you who they, who they sailed with, all right, and what their kind of claim to fame is. So right off the bat here, there's Diaz, there's Da Gama, there's Cabral, and then there's Albuquerque, okay? And this is how quick it happens, all right? We go down, we go back to here, back to the notes, okay? Diaz rounds the Cape of Good Hope, but the storms ended up pushing his fleet back, so he wasn't able to tack around the southern tip of Africa. But he did find the water, that there was land, and then there was open water. So he knew that there was another side, okay? He didn't make it, but his successor did, and that's Vasco da Gama. So da Gama makes it to India and goes back to India with ships that are full of spices of every um, imagination, okay? Now they're in, and they're starting to involve themselves in the spice trade. Um, there's another guy that comes uh, who's looking to go a little bit further, and he's on his way to go to the Indian spice trade, and the winds blow him way the hell off course. He ends up in Brazil. <laughs> yeah, so his name is Pedro Cabral. So Portugal kind of inadvertently like colonized Brazil. All right, that's why, you know, if you're Brazilian speak Portuguese, it was like a freaking mistake. All right, but Portugal ended up going there. Um, it's really the first time that there is contact with the Western Hemisphere. Okay, outside of, uh, what's his name? I think his name's Columbus. Yeah. But this is the this is the third important Portuguese explorer. Okay, so back Diaz. Okay, Diaz is able to round the Cape of Good Hope. Da Gama gets to India. All right, and then we get to Alfonso de Albuquerque, who now the now they have basically become participants in the slave trade, but they're sort of like screw that. We want to dominate. So the Muslims had controlled all of these coastal forts uh, and basically had monopolized the trade. And now the Portuguese are gonna come. And this time when they show up, they do it with all of their technological in, you know, innovations. The biggest one is that they had cannons that they could outfit on the side of their ships. All right, so they sailed and you know, instead of just kind of like walking in and giving them pickles, this time they absolutely just started bombarding uh, those coastal areas uh, and the Muslim ships. And before long, they had gained control of these four ports. Calicut, Ormuz, Goa, Malacca. Okay? I don't know. It'd be a cool, it'd be a really awesome, like, mean, it would be an awesome mean multiple choice question if I said all of the following, no. <laughs> except and then I put like Vancouver. <laughs> all right, so all vital centers to Arab domination of the South Asian spice trade laid the foundation for Portuguese imperialism in the 16th and 17th century. So now Portugal has Brazil, they have the west coast of Africa, they have started to gain some of the islands off of the west coast of Africa, and now they have got the Indian spice trade in some of the key island chains off the west coast of Africa off the east coast of Africa, all right? Um, 
This part is the technological advances. Like, here are some things that they were able to do that gave them an advantage. All right. Uh, we talked about the cannon. Okay. Um, great for ships, not really good for the land, but it really, really made a difference. It was like having the longbow. All right. The caravel ships versus the galleys. The galleys were like the old, like kind of where you had the, the slaves at the bottom of the ships and they were able to kind of row. That was great for the Mediterranean. It's not going to work in the Atlantic Ocean and it's not going to work in open water. So these are the sailing vessels, okay? Three masted sailing ships, all right, that were able to tack and were able to maneuver around some of the high winds and the currents um, and that the galley ships just couldn't deal with, all right? Then they talked about some other things you'll read about, like magnetic compass, enable sailors to determine their direction and position at sea, the astrolabe, which was able to determine latitude, okay, based on like where the sun was and the, the celestial bodies were uh, relative to position, okay, better maps and better charts. And that, that was really, before the scientific revolution, that really was the beginning of experimentation, of the idea that we need to have a more realistic and factual and accurate understanding of the world around us. That was all being done in navigational schools. And in a lot of the renovations, a lot of the innovations that ultimately uh, led to things like um, the, you know, the, the telescope and improving the telescope, the lenses and other things, that had all come from the navigational schools, okay? So there's, there's a, a learning component that's associated with it. There is uh, technological advantages that are associated with it. Um, that's, that's, that's a big part of it. Okay, we, I think we already talked about motive, so I was a little bit out of line, uh, out of order, I guess. Um, but remember the gold god and glory thing, all right? Um, you're not going to be able to read these. These are like chicken scratches. But if anybody wanted to know what they were, it was to show you that there was at least a, a compendium of um, accounts of what the of what it looked like to be in places that Europeans really had no imagination about. Marco Polo's travels is the beginning of it. Then there's one from this guy named Fernandez de Oviedo. Uh, there's a guy, an Italian by the name of Niccolo de Conti. And then there's John of Monte Corvino. Each of them had written something about being part of this commercial world and exotic places and exotic cities and uh, just, you know, a variety of different things that are piquing people's curiosity, okay, more than anything else. The Renaissance is a big part of it too, all right? There is something about man or humanity's ability to kind of understand and, and, and um, try to flourish in the here and now, okay? That, that sort of woke thing that's happening uh, in the Italian Renaissance, the age of exploration is sort of like a logical, you know, consequence of that. You know, this desire to be able to gain more knowledge and be able to acquire a better understanding of the world uh, that humanity populated. Okay. Um, let's see what else. Yeah. <laughs> the basic reason, material profit. All right. The other quote that I like the best is, besides gold, God, and glory, is this one from Ogier Gesselin de Busbeck. It says, religion supplies the pretext, gold the motive. Right? That's pretty obvious. Religion is the pretext, meaning that thing that I was talking about, where you can kind of cloak yourself in this idea that we stand for higher ideals, when the reality is you just want to get rich. Okay, that you can you can paint it in any way to make you sound like you're a better person. You wanted to get rich, and that's why a lot of these folks were doing what they're doing. It's not saying that there weren't people that didn't or that did have higher ideals in mind. Right? But the overwhelming desire was wealth, was profit. Okay, um, I hope you understand that. Okay, so if you say I'm trying to find Prester John, you know, I need to find those Christian kingdoms. It was gold, you know, and at least you can question motives. All right, but it's certainly that's part of it. Okay, all right, this Columbus guy. Um, and there's a section in the reading, and I, I kind of like the way that they, they tag this. It says, the problem of Christopher Columbus. 
Okay, Columbus is the beginning of the Spanish version of this story. Really what we've looked at so far is the Portuguese version of the story. And Portugal created an overseas trade empire, but it was really just that, a trade empire. Rather than it being like, uh, you know, where you actually resettle population and then gain control on the ground. Portugal was more establishing ports and like dominating commercially, but it wasn't like they were resettling a whole bunch of Portuguese and then having them um, intermarry with uh, the native populations and then build these robust colonies. That was Spain's gig, all right? That's what Spain did in Mexico, uh, in present day Peru, uh, all over Central and South America, in the West Indies, okay? Columbus is kind of the beginning of that. But it's a hard read. And there was this cat by the name of Samuel Elliot Morrison. And Samuel Elliot Morrison is the one that you guys read when you were in second grade and learned about Christopher Columbus. Okay? That's when everybody also believes in Santa Claus and all that other stuff too. What? <laughs> Stop. <laughs> okay? Oh, this is videotaped. <laughs> As some like three year old like stumbles upon this. <laughs> all right, look. Um, if, you ask, if you ask a seven year old kid, you know, can you tell me about Christopher Columbus, you know, or the Christopher Columbus Day? You know, why are there a whole bunch of people protesting the Chris, uh, the Columbus Day parade? Okay. Because there was a change. There was a change in viewpoint. But what we call this in history is called historiography, and it's really the study of interpretations of history. There is a traditional interpretation, there is a revisionist interpretation, and then usually there's some kind of synthesis or post-revisionist interpretation. The traditional interpretation of Columbus is obvious. It's, you know, in 1492, Columbus sailed the ocean blue. Okay? And then he showed, it sounds like Cartman a little bit. But there was that. It was that belief that Columbus is, you know, oh, he had God on his side and he brought the, you know, and all that crap, all right? And then all of a sudden, um, around the 1960s or 70s, when everybody's protesting the Vietnam War and a whole bunch of other things, and the AIM, the American Indian Movement, is starting to come out, and we start to, like, I guess, refocus on all of, like, the darkest episodes, not just in American history, but also in Western history, then they do a recalculation, all right? There's a figure by the name of Howard Zinn, and the beginning of his reinterpretation of American history is to look at Columbus coming ashore and having all of these Taino people like greet him and basically hand them whatever the hell he wants. Okay. And then having them open fire on the Tainos and end up destroying and decimating them. And so then Columbus gets refabricated as a genocidal maniac. That's not true either, but that's the story. And that anybody that celebrates Columbus is like some kind of like evil person, then why don't you might as well celebrate Hitler? Okay, Columbus was responsible for the death, indirectly or directly, of millions and millions of people. Okay, by the time the Amerindian populations, uh, if you fast forward to the point of first contact, to the middle to the latter portion of the 1500s, most of the island chains in and around Hispaniola, which is present day Dominican Republic and Haiti, were wiped out. They were wiped out by hard labor because somehow he had seen like gold trinkets and things that some of the Taino people were, were wearing and assumed that there was gold everywhere. So started to force labor on the Taino people to start digging for that gold not realizing that maybe there wasn't any gold and that they were all going to die because they weren't adequately fed, they weren't adequately housed, okay? It's to say nothing about the women, you know, who were taken advantage of. Um, and that you have, like, accounts of the fact that between biology, which was the introduction of smallpox and a variety of other things, and then harsh subjugation of the population, you literally wiped out every living, every original living thing in some of these areas, okay? Um, is Columbus responsible for that? I mean, did he write the words, I have an intent to commit massive atrocities on the people that I have contact with? 
No. All right. He definitely is a product of his times. He believed that he was bringing glory to Spain. He was. He believed that Christianity was the force for good. That once the folks were converted to Christianity, that they were going to be better off in the world. He also knew that slavery had been a very long practiced thing in Europe, in North Africa. It wasn't uh, uh, like a sub-Saharan African thing. It was a European thing. It was a sub-Saharan African thing. It was a North African thing. Um, it was, slavery was just a natural condition. And he was like, they seem to be kind of cool with it, which is not true, right? But Columbus gets, he gets all of those interpretations, all right? So it's either Columbus is a hero, and I promise you that if you go to some Italian-American communities in the Northeast on Columbus Day, there's a lot of pride, all right? He's a genocidal maniac, and I imagine if there's some Native American groups that they are organizing some type of protest on Columbus Day, and that it ought to not even be a holiday. It's ridiculous to them that it would be a holiday, All right? And then the third part is Columbus was a product of his times, whatever that means. And the only thing that you really can determine in terms of motive is what Columbus is writing, okay? And there was a fascination um, with native peoples that he had come into contact with. And it wasn't like, like modern racial attitudes, like these people are inferior, we must decimate them. All right, so he ain't Hitler, okay? It, there is an unfortunate, uh, whatever you wanna call it, there is an unfortunate end, you know, to that story. That whether, you know, Columbia and Columbus certainly didn't perpetuate it, but that's how it ended up happening. Okay. Now, with Cortez and Pizarro, you can say some different stuff. Okay, And those are a couple of names that you should know. I mean, Cortez, for Christ's sakes, took advantage of a myth about a, a, like a former emperor who had died that they said was going to come back. And he found out exactly how he was going to come back and showed up on that day. His name is Quetzalcoatl. Has anybody heard of that? Yeah. So Cortez played that up, all right? And the fact that, like, it just so happened that they were, they were talking about maybe because he was going to be a ghost when he returned, but he would, be, he would have a pale complexion. So when Cortez came back, he, like, he, he, went, he went with it. But then there was also strategy involved. He knew that because of some of the Aztec raids, he started to ally himself with the Aztecs' enemies, kind of like a divide-and-conquer strategy. Alta Hualpa, that was a whole different thing, okay? When Pizarro went there, it was like, we're gonna kill you. And Alta is like, I will give you like 50 warehouses full of gold if you let me go. He's like, yeah, I can't do it. So two million plus populations, some of the, the, the most organized and most advanced empires in the Western Hemisphere were wiped out inside of like 15 years. A lot of it has to do with um, disease. It's the only way you could really do it. All right. Some of it had to do with guns. Some of it had to do with myth. All right. But by the time it's all said and done, the Spanish have almost total control over Western island chains in the Caribbean. They've got total control over Central America, and they've got total control over good portions of South America. And they don't do what the Portuguese do. They don't create little trade posts. They took the whole damn thing over. And they set them up as colonies. You know, and so you'll read about that, the conquistadors and the encomiendas and all of the things. And that literally there was like a, a almost like a cultural deconstruction of the entire place. Okay? Where you don't even know what the original inhabitants look like anymore because it was almost like a, a total just, you know, destruction of whatever the purity was of that original culture. It was like it was wiped out. Okay? It was either exterminated or there were marriages between the, the Spanish and, and everybody that lived there. Okay, so, um, you've heard of things like mestizos, mulattoes. Okay, that, that's, you know, you're bringing three different cultures together. Eventually, Africans that had to replace the labor that was decimated uh, originally 
um, you had the native populations and then you had the Spanish. Okay, and you had various degrees of intermingling between those different groups um, as those colonies became more solidified. Right, so I think most of y'all are familiar with that stuff. So um, when you hear about the term biological exchange, um, does anybody know what that is? I know this is my chicken scratch. Could you imagine before type? How awful that would be. Do you guys have any idea how blessed you are that I can type comments to you all when you submit things? I used to have to write my comments and they look like this. Paragraph after paragraph of this. And they're like, Mr. Clement, can you read this? I'm like, I don't know, I'll give it a shot. I'll give it a shot. I heard it about 60 of those last night. Yes. Um, so anyway, um, I will throw a few things out here that just some stories about some of this stuff, but when you hear the words the Colombian or the biological exchange, it's not only um, like, hey, you gave us syphilis, we gave you smallpox. Um, but it was also. <laughs> it's fair. It's fair. Um, but it was also crops. It was also like sheep and goats and horses and things that were not native to one place that became uh, like heavily populated. There were no horses in the Americas before um, the European contact. You know, corn. There wasn't any corn in Europe. You know, that came. So there was some things that happened where like there was a trade of goods. There was a trade of a variety of things. But yes, disease was one of the things that got traded. All right, so that's part of it. And yes, there was major impacts because I mean, it's that guns, germs, and steel stuff, right? <laughs> Every time I say that, everybody laughs. I, I think it must have been like Valerie's go-to book. Yeah. All right. It really was. Whatever. So, but you, <laughs> but, you but you understand that there is, um, you know, there. If you're not like native yeah. to certain things, you don't have an immunity. You don't have generation after generation after generation that can build a resistance to something okay and that's kind of what was going on smallpox was just like a, a european pain in the ass okay <laughs> smallpox in north or central or south america was a wipeout okay bigger like as big as the plague in some cases bigly right bigly problems okay so um so just be familiar with that term and sort of what it means, all right? It's an exchange of a variety of different things. Uh, some of them good, some of them not so good. Um, has anybody heard of Magellan? Yeah. Okay, so um, I mentioned the, the Portuguese, and like these are some of your go-to people here. You got Diaz, you got Da Gama, you got Alfonso de Albuquerque. I didn't tell you that story, but there's a great quote about it. Like they were saying, like when Buddha arrived in India, he arrived on elephants. When Christ came to India, Christ was born on cannonballs. You have to think about it for a second. It's not like, you know, like when Buddha showed up, he showed up with elephants and Jesus was like, look out! It was that when Christianity came, it came on the back end of cannon fire. Okay, then that's sort of when they walked off the ships is after they had, you know, kind of like not napalm the place, but they, they sort of did that. Alfonso de Albuquerque. Albuquerque, Albuquerque is the name that is associated with domination. It's not, Da Gama was the one that initiated the exchange. Is it still going? Mm -hmm. All right, good. I'm so sorry, so after 49 minutes. What is it? Like 49 minutes. Oh, we're doing fine. right now. Huh? Yeah, all right well let's just I'm, I'm gonna stop shortly but i wanted to throw a few things in there too okay um i got other than magellan remember magellan is the one whose boats circumnavigated the globe it changes the game because there was still uh, like Kyrie Irving, a belief that the world was flat. All right, but when you start in Lisbon and you end up in Lisbon by going in a circle, you pretty much discounted the idea that it's flat, even though there were Greeks that had figured that out. Okay, it's sad that NBA players have not. But there is a round Earth, and that the circumnavigation pretty much proved it, even though uh, Magellan got clipped somewhere in the Philippines. 
um, the Pacific, the first person, like European person to put his eyes on the Pacific. And that's why they called it that, because they had gone down what's called the Straits of Magellan now, but it's like this <clears throat> treacherous current in the very southern tip of South America. And then when they got past it, it was like everything just like chilled. It's like being on the Gulf of Mexico side. All right. There were no waves. It was, and that's why it got that name, the Pacific Ocean, because right? it was it was the chill ocean. And then it picked up again. That's He's like, <laughs> yeah. Um, the big blue. All right. Okay. Um, all right. A couple of stories. One of them I already told you. Okay. Bartolome de las Casas was a late 1500s, late 16th century. Uh, I think he was a Dominican. I may, may be wrong about that. You guys will have to verify. Um, what? Did I... No, Do I need to spell it for you? No, no. We're talking about the same thing. We're talking about the same thing at the same time. Oh, I see what you're doing. Okay, cool. Um, but just remember what I said. It depends on where you read it. All right, but I'm going to read like an excerpt from the document because his first critique is really good. It's to let everybody know how exploited the Amerindian populations were. And he was like begging, like, you have to stop this. You are decimating these populations. So um, it is in one of the documents, and you can look at it. You can even do it as a PSD if you want. All right. Uh, if I could find it. I think we should camp Sunday night. Yep. I think that should be due Sunday at midnight. I think it should be what about that? Yeah. 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 I agree. That's, uh, yeah. that's the night of Yom Kippur. Yes. Yom oh, Kippur yeah. Yom Kippur is, is on Sunday. Yeah. Oh, sorry, Karen. So, I'll read, you this. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll, read you this. I'll read you this section. It says, um, this infinite multitude of people was so created by God that they were without fraud, subtlety, or malice. Toward the Spaniards who they served, Patient, meek, and peaceful, lay aside all the contentious and tumultuous thoughts. There is, if you read it, there's definitely like a superiority that is going on here. Okay? He sort of has that patriarchal sort of thing where these folks are children and we sh we're the folks that should know better. All right? But he says, their nation, the West Indies, is very poor and indigent, possessing little, and by reason they gape not after temporal goods, being neither proud nor ambitious. Their diet is such that the most holy hermit cannot feed more sparingly in the wilderness. They go naked, and a poor shag mantle is their greatest and their warmest covering. They lie upon the mat. So it kind of goes on and on and tells you how simple and happy and content and all of these things they are. And then he tells you the story about the Spanish coming like the wolves feeding on the sheep. All right even says that actually it says to these quiet lambs imbued with such blessed qualities came the spaniards like the most cruel tigers wolves and lions for these 40 years minding nothing else but the slaughter of these unfortunate wretches whom they have so cruelly and inhumanly butchered so that three millions of people with just which hispaniola itself did contain there left remaining alive scarce 300 people and the island of Cuba lies wholly desert, untilled and ruined. The islands of St. John and Jamaica. St. John just got wiped out again. Why oh, did those damn hurricanes? Um, lie de what, desolate and waste. Um, there was once like 500,000 inhabitants of some of these places. They were also wiped out. So he's like, I've seen this for myself. I've seen islands that were once robust that and populated between a half a million people. And they're now gone. All right. So ultimately, this is the story that he is telling uh, to try to get Philip to change the policy. This part here at the very bottom, and you can't read my writing, but it just says black legend. OK, is the is the other part. And I promise you that De Las Casas did not realize what he was doing when he said this. OK, is that he believed that the conditions of the type of labor that was being conducted in these islands in order to mine gold or whatever the case may be, uh, these docile, meek creatures of God or whatever you want to call them couldn't handle it. But he said that African laborers would be more suitable. 
okay? They were used to the conditions and the climate, et cetera, et cetera, and therefore they wouldn't die out in the way that the Amerindians did. And it's almost like the Spanish said, okay, you're on. And then the transatlantic slave trade follows. It starts with the sugar plantations and the Canaries and some of the other places, but eventually in order to be able to continue some of the mining operations and other things uh, that take place, especially in Brazil, uh, but in some other places, it is a massive, massive overseas uh, slave trading empire that develops. And it starts right around the time that De Las Casas was telling everybody to chill on the natives and maybe look at the Africans as an alternative. So it depends on how you want to read them, um, but certainly that story is there. There were three treaties here, and I just want to point them out, because basically what happened here is Spain and Portugal started to stumble upon one another as they were conquering territory. Okay, This is another thing that's going to happen in new imperialism when everybody was going to secure rights in the Congo, that explorers were starting to run into other explorers as they were screwing natives out of their own land that their conflicts were not among the natives and the people that were conquering them, they were among the conquerors themselves. So Spain and Portugal were like trying to claim jurisdiction over the Atlantic, and the Pope had to intervene in order to deal with it. The first treaty is called Alva Cavas, which was in 1479, and this is where the Spanish and the Portuguese were trying to figure out which of the islands off the coast of Africa belonged to who, okay? The next one that was that there was this papal demarcation line, and at the time, this is the orgy pope, Rodrigo Borgia, okay, who is Spanish, by the way, and it turns out that the treaty itself was very favorable to the Spanish, all right, to the chagrin of the Portuguese, to the point where there was going to be a major explosion between the Spanish and the Portuguese, and to alleviate it, they kind of went back and redid the boundaries, so that because... Portugal, if the papal line of demarcation in 1493 is adhered to, they're going to lose control over Brazil. So they had to draw this weird wavy line in order to determine what the Spanish had control of versus what the Portuguese had control of. But ultimately, by the Treaty of Tordesillas, T-O-R-D-E-S-I-L-L-A-S, in 1494, they came up with a they came up with a boundary, and that boundary pretty much means that if you see what the Portuguese overseas trading empire looks like, it is predominantly here along this coast, a couple of the island chains which got worked out in 1479, I think it is, and then control over uh, the Indian spice trade. Whereas Central South America and then the Caribbean is pretty much under Spain's control. Okay? There is very, very little penetration of the interior of Africa. Part of the reason why it was mosquitoes. Okay? Part of it was that they didn't have any kind of population that could do anything to settle those regions. This is Portugal we're talking about, not Spain. Portugal's like Rhode Island. Just so happens that there's a lot of Portuguese in Rhode Island. Oh. Little known fact. Okay. Um, Connecticut, too. Okay. Um, the only place that the Portuguese really had like a, a print was in this region called the Congo Kingdom. And it was right about here. Okay. And it was a little sliver of territory that they controlled. And part of it was because there were slaves that were coming out of that region. Okay, and there was a very powerful king at the time. Okay, and his name was Zinga Miemba. I'm gonna write it down so that y'all got. It. You don't have to clap. No, no. See, half of it seems like enthusiasm, and then half of it it makes it seem like you're making fun of it, and it's hurting my feelings. <laughs> It's all with malicious <laughs> trying to spite you. Here is another strategy. Okay. Um, <laughs> all right. So here's the other. Here's the other strategy. Um, and 
It represents more of a modern strategy on how Europeans were able to take advantage of other people. Um, it started out that they brought Christianity. And it turns out that Zynga Miemba was really embracing this Christianity thing. Okay, that he converts to Catholicism. Right, they build churches like in, 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 the, in the kingdom. But he's in charge and he regulates everything that goes on. All right, including the slave trade. And Spain, or I'm sorry, Portugal starts to smell the lucrative possibilities of being able to enslave the population that Zynga Miyamba's got control of. But they started out as friends. Okay? So Zynga Miyamba embraces them. He treats them, you know, like, like brothers, whatever you want to call it. He even converts to Catholicism and changes his name. He's like, I don't, I no longer want to be Zynga Miyamba. I want to be... Dom Alfonso. <laughs> he's like, that will make me sound cooler. And so he's all about this, you know, hey, I'm buying in, I am drinking the Kool-Aid. Portugal is an Portugal Portugal's an advanced civilization. I want to embrace it. And so there's this logic behind it, and they're like, we got him. All right. Later on, Karl Marx will call religion the opiate of the masses. They don't opiatize this guy. Okay. And while he's consuming all of this Portuguese culture and changing his dress and changing his name and worshiping in the church, okay, they start to run into the interior and capture people, put them on ships, and sell them. It's extremely rude. Okay. They were but here's <laughs> yes they were <laughs> but then he starts to realize that it, that's happening it's happening without his approval and then he finds out that member of his own family members of his own family are part of the group that's being captured and sold, sold into slavery so he's like this is kind of a downer for me <laughs> and he said no he sends a letter he sends a letter to the Portuguese king explaining the situation and said you know I I extended um, you know whatever you want to call it I extended peaceful gestures towards these folks um, I've embraced some of your culture I want you to know that this is happening on your watch because he's a political leader that's trying to communicate with another political leader saying let's handle this from the top and not only is he ignored, um, but then the king basically like gives some of the Portuguese traders like a, a lowdown on the fact that he's complaining about it. So they wait until he's worshiping in Sunday mass because he converted to Catholicism and they go into the village where he's worshiping and they kill him. Oh. Right, now he's out of the way and now they can, they can go gangbusters on the slave trade there, all right. So um, this is going to happen so many times in this continent over the course of many different years. But that was one of the first. And that was the, you know, while they're smiling and shaking your hand, they're going to stab you in the, you know, with their, with their other hand. Okay. And so there isn't a lot of, I mean, what did Cortez do? You know, what did Pizarro do? I mean, this is... I mean, it really is a pretty sad story uh, of exploitation. I, I would say if they had a do-over, a lot of these folks probably would have gone for the do-over. All right. Um, is there any other things? Let me just quickly go through McKay and make sure that I didn't miss anything. Um, there is about three documents in the McKay reading, and you're welcome to use any of them. They're pretty good. One of them is... And I would encourage it to look at a first-hand account from Christopher Columbus. I think that would be a cool document to examine. All right. Um, there's another one that's in here that talks about um, what the Swahili city-states look like in East Africa. This is before the Europeans were involved, okay, really in any kind of major way on what they saw. Later in the chapter, there's a couple um, that you can look at. One of them was looking at the spread of disease. That doesn't sound like that's all that exciting. All right. There's one about um, the leaders uh, in Mexico, the, the city, capital city in Mexico, or whatever is Mexico City now. It's called Tenochtitlan. 
and that's where. Uh, that's that. No, it's, it's, no, it's not. not. I'm sure it's pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I know what you mean. <laughs> I, mean. <laughs> I think it's like. <laughs> no, I think it's like <laughs> Tenochtitlan or something. I'm pretty sure it's Tenochtitlan. It's not Tenochtitlan. Also remember this is going on public domain. So if you say things that are they're gonna start it, roasting in the comments. It'll be um, yeah. <laughs> with all this nine subscribers. Um, <laughs> Alright. There's a section in there on the Colombian exchange. There's also an, a section in there on the economic impacts of the importation of Peruvian silver. Okay, this is going to create massive inflation in the 1500s in Europe. Okay, so that's a chapter that sure you sh certainly should take a look at because it is going to have dramatic economic impacts. Anybody that doesn't understand that, of where currency itself, if there is more currency in circulation, then the value of that currency is obviously going to go down. And that means you're gonna to have to spend more of that currency on the price of goods and services. So the importation of Peruvian silver into the European economy is gonna be a real downer, okay? And it's gonna take a while for them to be able to recover from that. And it might also explain why some of the pains uh, of the wars and other conflicts, if you pile those on top of everything that's happening economically, uh, it's not going to be a really good um, final story. Okay, um, let's take a break. It is 7.37. Now, before you get up, Hannah, I can't wait to get up. Can you go turn that off? What are you doing? 